Yeah. 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 Spandau Prison, a bleak fortress in the British sector of Berlin, controlled by the four occupying nations. Mark. Mark. Yep, there I am. I could have been one of those guys. Replacing, replacing the Russians. Here come the Russians. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> had the irony of being a, an Ivy League graduate platoon sergeant, which meant I didn't fit anywhere. I think there was a sample of two of us in the whole yeah, army. Really. So that's where I was, and we had various duties. Uh, we were symbolic troops. We were always had to be there when every politician flew over. I was, I was uh, in charge of a platoon when Nixon came. We were in Nixon's. For, I was from. For about 10 feet away from Nixon, we, all these people would come and they would have to say they brave defender of freedom in Berlin. Uh, twice, a, twice a year, we drove down to West Germany, 110 miles through the Carter, it was called, and we trained down there and shot and things like that. So we had to be combat ready. And uh, we, we were also in charge of security at Spandau Prison, which meant every four months we would take over responsibility for that. But the only orientation we had that I recall is that we were given what the standing orders were, you know, about what you could do with and without the prisoner. I also noted that we were not allowed to have any ammunition, which caused us a bit of concern. At the time, this was the time of a lot of student protests in Berlin, the anti-war and things like that. There was a guy named Rudy Deutschke who was very effective in leading anti-government things. And we were always, one of our jobs was to be backup for the Berlin police in terms of riot duty. So we practiced with that all the time. And we were worried about Rudy Deutschke. The, th the theory was that they might try to break into Spandau prison and, and take Hess out as a, as a hostage. Defendant Rudolf Hess, on the counts of the indictment, on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Hess served that life sentence in Spandau Prison in Germany. Only Rudolf Hess will remain the last mad symbol of the men who led Germany during the terrible years of Nazi rule. He was one, he was the only one, and we were told that the Russians refused to release him. I don't know if that's true or not. That is true. At yeah. that time, it was true. Yeah. yeah, he was the only one. It cost something like three or $400,000 a year to maintain this prison. And we were not allowed to talk to him. We were, you know, I, uh, I had a, a friend of mine who I'm still in communication with who was also in, in uh, Sergeant uh, Spandau Prison, and uh, he talked, he was real tall, and he talked about his head bumping on the top of the guard tower, his, his helmet liner. But he also reminded me that we were not allowed to shine any searchlights into the prisoner's cell. Mm. So I guess we were st even then we were concerned about political correctness. <laughs> and the only time you saw Hess was when he came out for his exercise. One of the standing orders was you were not allowed to talk to the prisoner. Okay, you're not allowed to talk. And my friend reminded me he used to go in this circuit with his head down and on the back of his deck is number seven. That was his prisoner number. We're in a path that's about six inches deep going in the circle, round and round and round. One day he looked up at, at one of the GIs in the towers and flipped him the bird, as it's called. <laughs> but he did talk to one of my guys once, one of my really young guys who was up in the tower, asked him for a cigarette. And the guy, he was a kid, he was 17 years old. He threw him a cigarette down to him, and Hess, cackling, took the cigarette up and showed it to the officer of the day, proving there had been communication. Mm. Got my guy busted. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Which just confirmed for us what we all thought of Hess anyway. He's just the last evil son of a gun. 
And if, the sooner we could get rid of the guy, the better. But we, didn't, we weren't allowed to do anything about that. So we would take over, for, we would do this, for, to do shifts for a month, and then we, we would hand it over to uh, the Brits. And then the Brits would hand it over to the French, the French to the Russians. But I have to tell you a story about, this was the only joint American-Russian military venture left in the world, the only one, mm -hmm. okay? And every time there was a change of guard ceremony, all generals from all four powers would show up. So there'd be the American general and the Brits and the French and the Russians. And they'd all, this is, this is an excuse for them to get together and have coffee and drink vodka or something like that, <laughs> I think. So they would all watch the ceremony, all right? Which is <clears throat> kind of what we saw in the movie here. Exactly. It was exactly what you saw in the movie. We would march in, into the gate, into the courtyard. The Russians would be there already assembled. And then we would take off and... When, when I ran it, I would take the first squad and we'd march around to each of the towers and one of my guys would go up into the tower and the Russian would come back down. The, the, the background, the subtext is that we were told if we showed up the Russian honor guard, we would get a three-day pass. Wow. You have to believe this is a big deal, especially in a place like Berlin, which is very hermetic. So we always figured out ways to show up the Russian honor guard. We were always successful. First of all, by the composition of the honor guard, we got the biggest dudes we could find. I mean, the guys, <laughs> I was small compared. We had huge guys, you know. And so the Russians would look at us like we were monsters. Of course, their propaganda was working overtime. So this one, the first time I did it, I remember we marched into the courtyard, uh, order arms, left face, and we were facing the Russians, and they were kind of like looking at us, these huge guys, right? And then it was time to go. So I took uh, the first squad back, and we all replaced. Now, what happened is that um, when, when the Russian squad got back, who had been in the tower, they got back, they saw all these huge American guys. Now, you can imagine what their propaganda was working in uh, overtime at the time. And so, the, the Russian uh, lieutenant said, right face, and you know how they kick step out. Well, the last guy in the last squad had just come back was so taken by the image of these Americans that he didn't hear the order. <laughs> so the Russian turn, and they're out the gate. And this poor little Russian private is standing there like this. And all of a sudden, he looked, and he went running out. He went running out after him, and we said, Another three-day pass. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Using distraction, which I think a lot of parents know about. I was in Berlin for 19 months. Wow. There was a lot of what are we doing there. I was, I was there at a time when the, the Chicago riots and Martin Luther King was killed and Bobby Kennedy was killed. And the exclamation point at the end of that sentence, that narrative sentence, was that Nixon got elected. Mm -hmm. And as a group, we couldn't, what are we doing here? It sounds like the country was falling apart. And, and so we often ask ourselves that. Uh, what are we doing here? The country is going crazy, falling apart. So that was kind of the existential dilemma each of us faced. At some point while you were guarding them, saying, you know, not only is this a waste of time, but he's a freaking Nazi. He's an evil person. It's okay to talk about evil. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our society is, has kind of evolved or devolved to a point where everybody's okay. Once in a while, people make bad choices. Now, I think there is evil. There's existential evil, but I think there is evil in the world. I think some people, for whatever reason, are inclined to evil acts, and I think we need to recognize it and protect ourselves from that. So we need to protect ourselves from evil. I think that's really important uh, as a lesson.